What are the basic first-line therapies? Basic first-line is education is number one. Patients want to have a diagnosis. They want to be able to go on the web and read about this disorder. It helps them from catastrophizing their symptoms. It makes them know that there are a lot of other people who have these kind of symptoms and that in many cases their disease isn't going to get any worse and may get better on its own in some cases. It lets them know things they can, or tell them things they can do to improve their symptoms. But they have control over the disease. So I think education, stress reduction, um, dietary changes they can make that are often very effective. These are all things that are useful. Not to change their entire lifestyle because they have this diagnosis, that kind of thing. That helps a large proportion of patients in and of itself. First line therapy could be physical therapy as is being presented at the AUA this year. Physical therapy with transvaginal field massage can be effective. And either oral or intravascular treatments. Um, amitriptyline, um, hydroxyzine, pentosan, polysulfate, cimetidine have all been used. We all have our preferences, but they're all options. And intravesically, DMSO, lidocaine, heparin are also mm -hmm. good options to consider. So the vast majority of patients can get significant improvement just with those steps. Are there any treatments that you understand that are commonly used in the community um, that differ from the guidelines that you developed here? Well, I'm not sure. I see a lot of patients who have been on antibiotics for months and months. And um, I don't think that's indicated. And in fact, that's we have a uh, standard that that shouldn't be done in the absence of reason to put someone on antibiotics like a culture-positive infection. I see uh, a lot of patients who've been on uh, anticholinergic medicines. Now, I'm not against anticholinergics if the patient thinks they're helping. But in general, a lot of times they can just make a patient thirsty. They drink more. They have all the side effects of the anticholinergic, and they're not generally effective in this syndrome, so I'm not a big fan of those. What are the anticholinergics? Uh, there are a lot, there's Vesicare, Ditropan, Oh, I see. Um, those gotta go drugs. That's all, all of those types of drugs, which they have their place in urology, they have a big place, but I'm not sure they have a place for this disorder. You mentioned that the guidelines were preliminary. Yes. What's left in the process? For those <clears throat> they are presently going through peer review. We expect that process to be finished in about uh, a month. And then they will, um, any changes that the committee feels are required as, as a result of the peer review will be made. And then they go to the AUA hierarchy. Uh, the heads of the guidelines process at the AUA and then the board at the AUA and then they're finished then they go into the journal and they get on the website but that's not the end of the story because every year every two years we're going to look at them we're going to make required changes based on new information that becomes available so they're always a work in progress does the fact that we have guidelines now from AUA mean that um, I, I see will be uh, included more in uh, medical education and in, in I hope so and the AUA certainly hopes so and um, <clears throat> we'd like to get it a part of the core urology curriculum and uh, I also think it's going to help the FDA and pharma because there's been this void in terms of what exactly are we talking about and how should it be diagnosed and what studies need to be done to get a drug through the drug process and does everyone need a cystoscopy and distension? It's a big area of controversy right now at FDA. So I'm hopeful that the guidelines will permeate that whole process and improve things for patients and make the process make more sense really. Oh, so do we, Dr. Hanel. Thank you so much.